What's up, ceramic students? Welcome back to the studio. After completing your first pinch pot, your first pinch form, uh, you're starting to kind of get the feel for um, what your hands are capable of, what the clay is capable of. Um, you probably made a few mistakes on the first one. You can look at it and go, okay, it was a great practice, but mm, probably don't love it. Um, if you do want to keep it, that's great. Um, flip it over and we'll scratch your name into the bottom and then we'll talk about uh, getting that transported back to school safely. It very likely has dried out now though uh, to the point where it is greenware, uh, what's sometimes called bone dry clay. It's so hard now that um, most of the water that's sort of hydrating the clay has evaporated off and uh, you're left with a sort of dried mud stage. Um, very fragile at this point. If, uh, if you dropped it at this point, it's not gonna deform like the sort of plastic workable clay, but it's gonna shatter. Uh, it's, it's kind of at a critical point, and there's some, there are some useful things we can do at this point. I mean, we could get a blade out and actually do some very detailed carving and scratching, but for the most part, I'm gonna say hands off uh, of a piece of um, greenware or boneware clay. Um, because it, uh, it produces a lot of dust when you work with it. And that dust will get all over your workspace, it gets all over your home, uh, you'll track it around uh, the school, but maybe worst of all, you'll uh, get it into your lungs. At home, if you're working in your studio, you're not wearing a mask, most likely. Uh, it's, much more, uh, it's much more possible that that dust gets up into the air, into your lungs. We'll try to avoid that as best as we can. Uh, so I want you to pay a couple of close, I want you to pay some close attention to what's going on on this piece before we start our second pinched form. Like for example, are there any spots that uh, cracks started to open up? Um, did you leave any textures that you didn't realize were there at first? Like even the sponge, right, will leave textures or the canvas board will leave a texture. Uh, were you able to successfully kind of pinch it out with any big cracks that made it fail or did a crack open up so that you can uh, see daylight through there? Um, these are all things that you'll have to sort of pick up uh, through your direct experience. There's only so much, right, that I can teach you by talking. Uh, the majority of the learning in this class is going to come through your hands. So let's, uh, let's take what we learned with that first piece and let's get a second piece going. Uh, you're going to need a little bit of water. And it's not a bad idea to have a towel close by. Uh, at some point in this project, we're going to need our tools. I really like to sort of keep my tools in a small jar or something like that, pretty close by, uh, keep them organized. And then uh, for this project, we're also going to need some liquid clay or what we'll call slip. Now, some of you guys at school, you can just kind of scoop your slip right out of my big slip bucket at school, no problem. I have um, probably small one and two gallon buckets uh, in the studio. I also have big 40 gallon trash cans full of liquefied clay, so we're not going to run out. Uh, the biggest reason that I have so much of it is it's part of the clay recycling system, which is important for you guys to remember at home if you don't have slip. Like, for example, if I don't have slip from school, well, where do I get it? Uh, it would be pretty difficult to take a piece of clay and turn it into a liquid if it's already sort of at this workable stage. It's pretty, uh, pretty tricky to go from wet clay backwards in the clay life cycle into wet clay. But if you take some of this clay, and this may be a good idea for those of you guys who are sort of working from home and you're not coming into school very often or maybe even ever, uh, dry out some small chips of clay, uh, make a small pile of them, dry them out, they'll be fine overnight. And um, when they're totally bone dry, not unlike uh, your pinch pot from before, crush them up, put them in a small container, and add a little bit of water, and within five or ten minutes, they'll totally dissolve and liquefy. There's something about the sort of dried up uh, boneware clay or uh, greenware clay that almost instantly transforms backwards into wetware. There's a bit of a lesson there. If you're right on the edge of a piece of clay that's too dry to work on, but you're trying to finish it up, and you grab your spray bottle and you spray a piece of boneware clay, uh, it's not going to rehydrate, it's going to melt. So let's keep that in mind with some of these pieces down the, down the road that uh, there is a point of no return. We can't rehydrate pieces like that. They just dissolve. Let's, uh, let's get a piece of clay about the same size as what we grabbed last time. Something, uh, well, you know, a little bit larger than a golf ball will we'll get you about the size we had before. Uh, but this time, we're not going to stop with the sort of simple pinch pot form. Uh, we're going to do a modified pinch pot. 
uh, modified pinch pot is going to include two basic kinds of sculpting. Uh, we have the option to either add clay to your piece or to remove clay from it. And if that's too vague for you, I'm going to be demonstrating uh, one kind of goofy project, goofy approach to this. Um, every time I pick up a, a pinch pot like this, I always sort of imagine it's sort of like a mouth, right? Especially when it's got real organic edges. And so uh, I've, uh, I'll demonstrate on this project how we'll actually transform this thing into a bowl. Uh, well, it is a bowl already, but transform it into a bowl that has actually got a mouth on it with some teeth and a nose. That does both of the projects, right? We're going to add some clay and sculpt it back, and then we're going to carve back the teeth. That's one kind of goofy way you could do it. Um, you could also take two halves of a pinch pot, join them together, and have a total uh, total form. Think uh, character design, something with a few legs. Um, or if you've got some great ideas that you'd like to apply to your piece, uh, this is your opportunity to sort of uh, modify our first pinch pot and turn it into a sculpture. Just like we started our previous pinch pot, go ahead and hand wedge the clay. If you noticed uh, that when you were doing your first pinch pot that your clay was starting to crack a lot uh, or it didn't really move, it just sort of you know crumbled, a couple things might be going on. Your clay might be too dry, but probably more likely you're either moving too fast or you didn't hand wedge your clay enough uh, or you weren't hand wedging it and like aggressively enough. If you're just kind of massaging the clay, that's not going to do it. You really need to kind of mix the clay in your hands. And now from here on this first day of working on this piece, um, it's very much, it's gonna feel pretty much like a repeat of what we did on the first, on the first piece. I'm gonna divide up this tutorial into about three pieces. Um, if you've got a little bit of time, you've got an hour or two to set aside for this project, you could probably just watch straight through uh, and do all of your work in one sitting. Uh, more likely, we're going to do, uh, do it over the course of three days. Uh, so this will be the same tutorial and we'll just kind of skip to the sections uh, that apply to what you're working on. Grab a little bit of water and begin by dimpling the top of your clay and that dimpling will eventually become an opening and that opening will eventually become your bowl. Remember that um, the small sort of compressions, the small squeezes are going to do a lot better for you than trying to work too quickly. That said, since this is your second pinch pot, things should probably progress a little faster. You sort of have a feel for what the clay can do. You kind of sort of have a vision for where you're going with this piece. Uh, your hands will remember uh, how to pinch the clay and, and where, to put your, where to put your energy and how to kind of work it. Uh, so this will probably take you maybe half the time that your first pinch pot took. Uh, that'll always be the case this semester. We'll, we'll pick up a skill. We'll practice it once or twice, and first time you do it, kind of embarrassing, a lot of mistakes, uh, takes a long time. Second, third, fourth time you do it, you're really kind of honing those skills, you're developing the hand memory, and, uh, and things should progress. Pretty soon, what I'm really hoping for is that um, with just a couple of basic techniques, like hand building is a very simple technique, with a couple of simple techniques, uh, you guys will... Um, you'll start to apply your own sort of creative energies to it. I know that at first sometimes the, the technical hurdles feel really big and they sort of overshadow a lot of the kind of individual kind of creative part of what might go into this class. But as an art class, I'm really interested in, uh, in what you do with the techniques that I'm going to teach you, not necessarily, you know, your exact duplication of my techniques. That said, if you just can't think of anything to do with your pinch pot, you're welcome to follow right along with my technique and turn it into a mouth pot.
once you get your piece sort of opened up again, remember uh, that there's only so much we can sort of push the clay for, uh, push the clay to. I mean, if you can get it down to about a pencil thickness um, on your first sort of 15, 20 minute work session on it, uh, you might want to pause because it starts to get a little weak and it structurally it just won't hold itself up very well. Uh, and so uh, we're planning this piece to take um, probably two or three days of class time, which means you sort of have to um, modify your drying uh, dry times, right? You have to be careful not to let it get too dry in between class sessions. Uh, if you want to add clay to the outside of your piece, uh, which I'll be doing to this one, I don't, uh, I don't want the clay to get too dry. I'm going to be adding wet clay to a piece that will have had one day to dry already. And um, I want to make sure that, uh, that the two clays are pretty close in dryness. If I add uh, wet clay to dry clay, it's a good chance that whatever I'm adding is going to pop off. It just won't adhere. Uh, we'll talk about why that is later on this semester, but um, we're going to try to manage our dry times a little bit more carefully with this project. Uh, with the last project, I sort of wanted it to dry down to, uh, to leather hard for the second day, and that gave us some control over thinning the walls and, and a few other things. Um, but this one, really depending on... Uh, really depending on what you're doing with it, uh, you may not want to dry it quite as much. So here are, uh, here are sort of two potential techniques we can use to more carefully manage our dry time. The canvas boards uh, are really handy ways to store your clay and to slow dry them. So if, uh, if you were hoping to sort of bring it down to, um, say, leather hard dryness, about the same uh, we did with our first project. Um, just leave it on the canvas board and cover it with the plastic bin. And the next time you come back to that, you know, if it comes, if you come back to it the next day, something like 12 or 24 hours, uh, expect it to be leather hard, pretty, pretty stiff, but still somewhat workable. If, uh, like me, if you're actually hoping to come back and add some things to the clay and you're, you want it to be uh, roughly the same level uh, of hydration, right? Still pretty workable. Put a piece of plastic down on the canvas board first and you should have a, a smaller piece of plastic in your kit if you don't just cut a little stripe off of your um, off of the clay block block and if you cut it so that it hangs over the edge of the canvas board a little bit you can kind of pin it down inside of your uh, inside of your bin so that should be a pretty great seal uh, that'll be the same uh, same workability tomorrow uh, uh, when you transport it in. If you're planning on walking that to school uh, the next day, probably not a bad idea to flip your piece over and, and make it stand on whatever the most stable side you can figure out is. Mine is much more stable upside down, and so that's how we'll transport it. What's it, guys? So uh, I'm back on day two, or actually for me, it's not really day two. I just um, gave it some time in the studio to dry. Um, if I had had this piece totally covered in plastic, uh, it'll very likely be the exact same sort of hydration level as where I left it. Um, I didn't. I actually left mine out in the open air. I gave it um, probably an hour or so. I even had uh, a little bit of heat blowing in the studio, so it, it dried it faster instead of waiting 24 hours. Um, I can come back to this piece and work it, and it's um, not quite leather hard, uh, but it's much more rigid now. Now it'll take a little bit more uh, sculpting. Today, uh, what we're talking about is um, we're actually going to get beyond the basic pinched form and begin really shaping it into um, what, uh, what your vision for this piece is. If, uh, if you're following along with my vision, today we need to add um, a block of clay that is going to be the nose. We, uh, we have somewhat of a limited amount of time for adding clay to the piece. It has to be um, sort of wet wear clay. It has to be pretty moldable. If the piece gets too dry, we can't add anything. Then after we add the clay, I'm going to do a nose, set of lips, maybe even cut back the shape it a little bit. Um, after we add the clay, then we actually have another day or two of carving clay away. As the clay stiffens up to leather hard, it gets easier to carve. And then um, maybe at the end of our last day or a third or fourth day, um, we will talk about finishing work. Uh, and it, it follows that progression. Now think about it this way. Um, anytime I'm working in uh, sort of objects, uh, sculptural objects or otherwise, uh, work out the big stuff first and then gradually get more and more detailed. Uh, you'll notice that I'm not fussing over small carvings today yet. I still have some really big things to take care of. 
uh, one of the first things that I'm working on is just thinning out the wall again, making sure that uh, the piece isn't too thick. Uh, if I need to sort of fix any big goof ups, um, today is really the last day that I have the ability to make big changes or repairs to the piece. Um, if there are big cracks, I gotta get them taken care of while the clay is still wet. Um, just gonna kind of work out the thinness here. So I'm gonna actually get to the point now of um, adding some of the clay that I need. Uh, part of what this will, uh, part of what this will look like. I'm going to add a piece of clay that's um, nose shaped. Uh, for that, it might be easier to turn it right side up since uh, it makes a little more sense. And noses are sort of um, triangular shaped. And so I'm gonna make a piece of clay that's sort of skinny at the top and fat at the bottom. For that, I just need to get a piece of clay off the block. And there are a lot of ways you could, you know, shape this. You can sort of hold it up there and, and sort of kind of blend it in. Uh, what I'm going to do is roll a skinny coil, and uh, probably have too much clay here for doing what I need to do. Coil rolling is uh, is a bit of a mystery kind of thing. Until you practice it a few times, it can it'll just kind of be a little bit of a difficult project. You always end up getting a little bit of a flat tire thing going on. Uh, we have a project where we will talk quite a bit about uh, rolling good coils, but for now I'll just say that the, the coil I'm rolling here is sort of fat at the bottom. That'll be the nostrils, and then it gets sort of skinnier and skinnier toward the top. I'm not going to fuss too much over making it perfect just yet. Uh, what I essentially am going to do is sort of figure out how much clay I need there, and then get my scoring tool. have about the right sized nose but the bridge of the nose is a little too big and anytime I have clay that I'm not going to use I can just add it right back to my block it's a really handy way of making sure you don't waste too much clay or lose it too much so that's probably still a little big but I'm going to go with that for now uh, the bridge of the nose is just going to blend right into the bowl chop off a little bit more and now if you're going to attach any clay, if you're going to stick clay to clay, you need your scoring rib uh, because you have to scratch the back of the clay. Uh, remember, wound the clay. If you want the clay to stick to each other, you kind of have to wound it. And you're going to need a small bucket of slip. The slip is something that you can either get from school or you can make it at home. And you have a slip brush in your kit. Now this is actually what they just call a chip brush. It's just sort of a cheap uh, paintbrush, sort of a Home Depot variety. And the slip that you're using should basically be the consistency of ketchup. This slip jar is a little thick. I might have to blend a little bit of water with that, but you should easily be able to get slip on your brush. And I'm not going to brush that slip onto the clay. I'm just going to dab it. And uh, that creates a sort of a liquid bond. It, uh, in some ways, it sort of, you can think of it as almost melting or welding the clay together. That's what the slip uh, does. Don't really think of it as glue. Glue is a sort of a chemical bond between two materials. This is quite literally clay getting clay to stick to clay. Uh, the glue here, the slip, just is clay. Uh, so it's much more like a metal weld than it is like gluing. Uh, so now I'm just going to kind of get that piece in place. The the exact shape of it, I might fuss over a little bit later, but the real problem here is just getting it attached. Once I get it on, maybe I'll take a thumb and kind of blend the bridge of the nose in. It's, uh, it's still going to be totally possible. In many ways, it's a lot easier to remove clay than it is to add it. So I'll get it stuck down and weld it in place using my thumb to just sort of blend the clay little bit of shaping but not too much. I'm not going to fuss over the details just yet because I still have a pretty wet piece of clay here. Just mostly want to get that bulked in so that later on when it comes to actually doing the sculpting I can uh, I can work with a stiffer piece of clay. 
something like that. Now, I'm going to kind of need some nostrils there. I might find a tool to sort of stick up his nose. Maybe the butt of a paintbrush would work just fine. Or, you know, anything else you've got around. Maybe the butt of a Sharpie. Um, they do make some really interesting tools uh, to work in clay or work in modeling that sometimes I'll show you guys. I'm not going to get in the habit of using too many of them for our sculptures this semester. I don't want you guys to think that, you know, I've got access to tools that you guys don't. But... Sometimes one of the tools I like to use is uh, sort of a modification of the wire tool that, uh, that you guys have in your kit. This is actually a cheese cutter, uh, but it basically uses the same idea. But in this case, uh, it sort of allows me to do more of a freehand cutting and shaping. I probably found this thing at a garage sale or Goodwill or whatever. And pretty, uh, pretty easy tool to use, make use of in the studio. It's just got a tight wire. If any of you guys have a little bit of uh, woodworking skill, I'm sure you could probably put something like that together in wood. Oh, another tool you guys might find useful here is the butt end of your X-Acto blade or maybe one of your other rounded tools. I need to sort of create some nostril openings here. There's going to be rough openings for now. Uh, but what you'll notice is as soon as you put the sort of opening, the nostril openings in, your, uh, your nostrils will start to inflate and nostrils are almost never perfectly round and so now is when you get to sort of make some decisions about what sort of shape your guy's nose has back end of a paintbrush will work just fine here and if you blow a hole in the nose you could always do a little bit of repairing later on but that sort of gets the nose roughly into shape and now i'm going to add this sort of lip line before I do that, I think I may actually create a little divot on either side of the mouth, kind of like the corners of his mouth. Maybe I'll stretch a wire across so I can sort of see roughly where that divot is going to be. And I could cut that divot out with a, any number of different tools. Um, a fettling knife uh, is, a, is a tool that we'll eventually put into your kit. Uh, this is not a fettling knife. It's actually an old steak knife. A fettling knife sort of looks like this. It's a tool that's specifically designed uh, for working in clay and it's a really handy tool. Um, I honestly, before I ever bought a fettling knife from a store, I just ended up using uh, a steak knife that I'd filed down the sharp edges on. I still use it to this day. I kind of like the, the heft of it. Uh, another thing I could do is just sort of use that wire tool to sort of slice out along the edges. I have a small wire tool sort of like this which is uh, actually just an old cheese cutter. And I've also taken an old jeweler's saw and stretched a wire uh, across that. And that allows me to sort of work symmetrically on small pieces like this if, if per perfect symmetry is sort of uh, something that you like. An old jeweler's saw or what's uh, sometimes called a fret saw uh, could work really well for that. If you're wondering what kind of wires I really like to work with, if I'm ever making my own uh, sort of custom-made tools, honestly, uh, if you know anybody who plays the guitar, uh, the high strings, like the E string, uh, are really great. They're a really great weight for cutting. So if um, you know a friend who's tuning up his guitar or something like that and, you know, throwing strings out to restring, have them save those for you. They make really excellent, uh, excellent wire tools. Now, I kind of have the corners, the rough corners of the mouth cut that, you know, may get modified at some point. Essentially, the, the clay that's exposed here at the opening will become the teeth. And uh, I'm going to add a little bit of clay around the outer edges. And those will become a lip around the edge. So, for this... I'm going to need another really skinny coil. Let's start by rolling that in my hands and then roll it out on my canvas board. Anytime you roll coils at all, the tendency for the canvas boards to just suck the moisture out of them is really good. And so I like to keep my spray bottle around, give it a couple of light sprays. And what I'm doing here is this clay is going to pretty much run corner to corner around the outside 
of my teeth here. And that'll be a bottom lip for, uh, for my character. Now I could score and slip this, but my clay is feeling really, really wet. And so instead of scoring and slipping this one, I'm just going to sort of blend it or what you might call weld that into place. Uh, if the clay is really wet, you can get away with this technique, but be careful. If, you, uh, if you're starting to work with clay that's drying out, uh, this is a really great way to have things pop off down the road. Um, I can sort of feel how wet the clay is. There's plenty of sort of weldability here, like it's not gonna pop off, it's, it's staying put. So just using one thumb to kind of blend that line into place. In order to make this technique work, the two clays that I'm joining have to be about the same wetness or same dryness. If one is drier than the other, um, scoring and slipping is sort of the answer to that problem. So I've got a bottom lip put in place. Let's kind of imagine all those teeth being almost like one solid block. And then I'll put one more lip on the top. And I'm not fussing too much about, you know, necessarily being anatomically correct here. I know lips are not the same uniform shape all the way around. And, you know, there are some, there's some more definition here. This is a bit more of a caricature or character of a of a face i'm not trying to be anatomically correct just yet oh we'll get there we've got a sculpture project later this semester where we will try to make it uh, as accurate as possible this project's just a bit fun a bit goofy a bit weird So I've got um, a pretty rough sort of sketch here, sculptural sketch of where this is gonna go. I've got, you know, instead of individual teeth sculpted, I've just kind of got a big block of teeth. The nose is in place, but it's certainly not quite right. It's not shaped quite like a nose, but my clay is so, so soft yet. I need to give it another, uh, another night of drying. So I will join you guys again in the next tutorial and um, we'll sort of be picking up with day three of work on this guy. Uh, overnight tonight, I'm definitely gonna put a piece of plastic down first. The plastic that goes down first now uh, is gonna make sure that this thing sort of is frozen at its current uh, state in, uh, in hydration. I don't really want it to dry out too much more uh, if I give this one more night under a bin with plastic, uh, it'll probably be just right for tomorrow. What's up, ceramic students? Uh, welcome back to the studio. This is sort of our finishing day. Um, probably day three, maybe even day four, uh, we're probably working with a piece of clay that's finally reached uh, a stage in the sculpting process where um, it'll hold marks really well and it actually will carve really well. Probably a little too far gone to be adding large amounts of clay, I probably couldn't do something like, you know, add the nose of this goofy pot on at this point. Um, but now that the clay has, uh, has sort of stiffened up, I can do some more detailed work. And for that, um, you know, we can talk a little bit about how to, uh, how to shape the individual teeth, where to put them, how to place them. But maybe um, before I even get there, this conversation about like, what tools might I use? And some of these things you have in your kits and some of them uh, you don't, so I'll start with the tools that you guys have ready access to. Um, these wooden ribs or these modeling tools we're going to use all semester long, and I like to buy these for you guys because um, 
one, they're just sort of like a, a classic beginner starter set, uh, but also they're really easy to modify. The wood, um, the wood that these are made out of uh, is soft enough that if uh, right from the factory, uh, you know, they didn't quite get their edges right or, you know, it's not quite the shape you want, uh, you can easily take, maybe uh, maybe start with your 220 grit sandpaper just to get a sense of, you know, how soft your wood is and, um, and just shape the tool. We also have some power sanders at school, like a belt sander um, that uh, can help sort of rough out maybe a more accurate shape. Uh, one of the things I did with my tool almost immediately is um, I sort of sharpened this chisel point. Uh, it was real blunt when they sent it and I would like to use this uh, to do things like maybe marking off where those teeth are going to be and sort of adding some chisel marks in between each tooth. Uh, this sort of helps me space out uh, you know where the teeth are going to be and sort of maybe even do some basic cutting. Uh, very similar to how I might use a fettling knife and uh, in the previous video I talked about how you know I just use an old steak knife that's been roughed off on the edge uh, but eventually you guys will have one of these fettling knives which um, uh, are really great tools for just all sorts of things uh, using the handle as a shaper using the blade uh, using the tip as a drill all kinds of awesome tools for that now another tool uh, that I find really handy for doing all kinds of detail pointed work is uh, the needle tool. Maybe using the side of the needle tool to do a similar kind of scribing work uh, or dimpling, uh, but then also using, uh, using the point as a scribe to, um, to sort of draw into the clay itself. Uh, needle tool can be a really great tool. And in the last video, you know, we used the handle uh, to sort of open up the nostrils. Uh, you'll notice that uh, when you become really fluent with some of the tools in your kit, you know, you figure out which ones you're always reaching for. Uh, you sort of make use of all the surfaces. Even the knurling on the uh, on the handle itself can make for a really great texture. Um, now there are a couple of higher end tools that you know that are available uh, through all kinds of different uh, suppliers. Um, brand names, uh, you know, to pay attention to. I think that, that are some of the higher quality ones might be like Mud Tools or these ones uh, X I E M pronounced Sim or Zim. Um, these are more like dental picks, honestly. They're these really nice hand forged stainless steel things. I, I never have ever had to like reshape a tip on these. They're always really, really nicely made. Um, the bummer about these tools is they're kind of on the pricey side. If you can imagine me paying a couple dollars for a whole pack of these wooden ribs and sculpting tools, uh, you'll pay uh, anywhere between five and 15, 20 dollars a piece uh, for some of these tools. Although, uh, you know, if you really get into uh, clay sculpting and modeling, uh, those are really excellent. Uh, I think you can get a whole kit of them for between 30 and 40 bucks or so. Um, I also, uh, if I'm trying to do some very detailed carving and very dry clay, uh, will use an X-Acto blade. And I've modified the tip of a couple of these X-Acto blades. Um, these are just old dull blades that, uh, you know, aren't maybe good for cutting paper anymore, but they're great for doing detail work in clay. And on one of these, I've sort of uh, nipped off the end. And if you're very curious, if you're curious about sort of doing some custom tool designing, we can do that at school. Uh, or if you have some of the equipment at home, uh, that's fine too. Now, I, oops, I left my slip brush out last night. Uh, but the slip brush can also be shaped quite a bit too. If you ever do that, you, uh, you didn't ruin your brush. That's just dry clay in the tip. Um, just drown that in a dish of water. And by the time you get going, uh, that will have dissolved and just turned into slip inside of the, uh, inside of the bowl. Uh, last thing I'll say is I have provided a couple of, um, maybe I'll call them tool blanks, uh, popsicle stick and stir sticks. Now we do need these for a project in the future, but if you, uh, you know, you want to do some custom tool work, these are great kind of places to begin. Um, the wood is much easier to shape than say aluminum or steel. Uh, so you can kind of get a feel for what the, what kind of tools you like to use. Uh, but you know, just kind of remember everything you guys have access to in your kit is fair game. Um, everything that I've given you, uh, you're welcome to modify. These tools belong to you. And um, if you want to do some tool design in your own studio space, find things around the house, modify a tool, um, I think that's great. I think uh, learning to be um, sort of fluid with uh, what tools you reach for and how you use them um, is the sign of somebody who's really invested in their work. So let's talk about, you know, what we're going to do today on this thing to kind of bring it home. Uh, kind of two stages of finishing work and I'll just sort of repeat again that this um, this is something that uh, you won't be able to do until your piece has sort of reached its um, 
uh, kind of like leather hard stage stiffening up. If it's not quite there at the beginning of your work, um, make sure that you don't get too, uh, and make sure you don't just do this work too early. Uh, the, the clay doesn't hold very much detail if you get to work too early on it. Now I'm just going to kind of go through and sort of mark off, uh, you know, the divisions or the divides of where the uh, individual teeth will be. Uh, the only one I kind of sort of like to place is, you know, right below the nose, give them, you know, give them that split right in the middle. Just about everything else is, uh, is sort of living as a bit of a caricature, right? I'm not trying to be accurate. You're more than welcome to, uh, to make it as accurate as you want. Um, what I'm going to uh, try to do with my teeth here is just kind of give them a little bit of a, uh, uh, a divide using this chisel tool. And then I may shape them a little bit, make one tooth a little higher or lower. I'm going to make my guy look like uh, I probably could have used braces as a kid or something. Um, it, uh, it's not, you know... It's not a realistic sculpture, it's just kind of a goofy thing. And so maybe I'll come in with uh, an X-Acto blade now and uh, do things like maybe make one tooth a little higher than the other, kind of chisel them off. And um, I'm following the same basic, um, basic technique as I followed on the previous project uh, where I said I'm going to work big to small. I'm gonna come through and try to sort of uh, rough in the teeth where I kind of sort of like them chisel down some of the edges, rough them in, and then uh, as the clay gets drier and drier, I know that it will hold more detail, so I, uh, I'll sort of be patient about doing any real detail carving until that happens. Uh, maybe I should have said this right off the get-go, but if there is any more carving that you imagine doing, I'm sorry, any more adding uh, of clay that you need to do, like oh, you realize, ooh, you weren't quite finished, you sort of needed to, um, needed to do a little bit more work, uh, start with that clay first. Uh, the clay that comes right out of the bag that you're working in is pretty wet. And at this point, if I need to stick any clay to this guy, uh, that really wet clay is joining somewhat, you know, more dry clay. And the dry clay has begun to shrink back a little bit. And the wet clay that you add has yet to shrink. And so you're going to have this kind of shrinking differential going on where your one, one side of your work is going to continue to dry. And the other piece has got a lot of shrinking to do. And what that ends up doing is it puts a lot of stress on the joint or the weld, the kind of clay weld that you've got. So if you attach some wet clay and it has a lot of shrinking to do, it causes fractures right at the joint. Uh, to avoid that, uh, use slip. You, know, you really can't avoid it at this point. You really gotta use slip, moisten the clay, and also score the clay or scratch the, or scratch the clay up and wound it. Uh, it looks like I uh, kind of forgot this guy's frenulum here or whatever that little skin is that connects your upper lip to your nose. And so I'll grab a bit of slip and my scoring tool. Yesterday uh, in the tutorial I mentioned that um, your slip should be roughly the uh, roughly the, uh, the consistency of ketchup or I'm not much of a ketchup fan so I'll go with mayonnaise, roughly the consistency of mayonnaise. Uh, you don't want it to be super runny. I mean water can be a useful tool in the art studio but if you're imagining that, you know, really, really runny, watery slip is doing the job. It probably isn't. Um, not at least, uh, not at least as good as, um, you know, some nice liquidy slip. And so something like this that I got in my jar here is about perfect. It holds in the bristles. It's not dripping off the end. And since I'm going to be adding a big piece of clay to sort of mound up his upper lip here, and connect. I'm just going to work, wound the clay all around his upper lip here. Give him a bit of a scoring mustache. Hydrate that clay with slip and then begin to sort of build that up. And I'm not only kind of pushing it in to stitch the two clays together, but then I'm going to go through with my thumb and blend that clay away. Now 
surface since that clay is pretty wet. I'm not going to fuss too much over sculpting it at this point. If actually, um, I may add a little bit to the sort of tip of this guy's nose just to make sure he's got a nice old guy bulbous nose. And since that nose is really dry, anything that sort of sticks out and off of your piece is always going to dry the fastest. And uh, that makes sure I really have to get in there and blend this clay in. This is a little bit like uh, like pinch potting, right? Like small choppy movements. I'm trying to kind of compress the clay and work it in and then use my thumb as kind of a polishing tool. Uh, that's a really good way to get the clay to kind of stitch in there is to just really work it down, compress it. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a little time sort of sculpting the teeth and uh, some of that I'll leave here in the video so that you can watch it watch it happen, uh, but I'll probably jump ahead a little bit uh, to some of those final stages here of uh, thumbing down any textures off the outside of the piece. Um, but now, sort of working the teeth here. I'm going to uh, kind of go all the way around the mouth with my big my big adjustments here, my big carving, any, any clay I need to remove, and then I'll come back in and you know maybe do some really detailed work at the end. Okay, so, you know, when I started this video, um, he sort of had almost like a continuous bar of teeth across here, right? It wasn't uh, divided up at all. Now I've gone through and divided each one of the teeth out. Um, I'm not, you know, they're not individual, right? I'm just kind of marking them with a line. Sometimes the line is a bit, of, bit more of a gap. Other times it's sort of real tight. I've sort of pretended a little bit with my sculpting, like he's got some overlapping teeth and... You know, truly, this guy should be uh, headed to the dentist sometime soon. Um, but uh, I've I've worked them in, and they almost feel more like stones. You know, in his mouth at this point, they're sort of chiseled and faceted. And now that I've got the big sort of big sculpting done, I can go back in and gradually uh, work some of these down. If I, you know, if I was a little bit maybe too obvious or too clunky with some of my sculpting at first, I can I can always kind of tone it back and. You know, maybe shorten some of the teeth, make them not look quite so, quite so gnarly, or just you know leave it and keep it kind of wonky and weird. I'm going to come back up to that uh, that upper lip that I was sculpting earlier on and make sure that uh, you know I kind of give him just a bit more, um, a bit more shape to that lip, and just make sure that that clay that I added at the beginning of this tutorial uh, session here uh, is actually really well formed. And if I goofed up any areas around those nostrils that I, you know, kind of tried to do my best to repair those. Um, it's not, uh, this guy's not going to be perfect. No need for that. Okay. Now, um, last thing, maybe one more tool and then one more technique before I, uh, before I call this thing quits and, and uh, look forward to kind of seeing where you guys are at with it in the studio. Um, I'm going to probably bring a sponge to this here and maybe use a bit of water, but I wanted to show you one other tool that's really kind of different from most of the uh, other tools that we have in our kit. A lot of the shaping and sculpting tools are hard edge, um, you know, sharp edges of wood or even rounded edges of wood, real hard stuff, or the metal uh, blades or shaping tools, right? It's all hard. Well, there are a series of tools that are um, sort of like brushes, right? Brushes are, um, are sort of designed to have sort of nice, soft, responsive tips. Um, these ones are actually silicone tipped 
and uh, there are a bunch of different sort of grades and softnesses of the silicone. Uh, we have a few hiding in the studio if you'd like to give it a shot. I've also sort of made my own uh, few tools, but uh, what these uh, silicone shapers do, or what they're sometimes called smoothers, is um, they can sort of help uh, remove some of the aggressive tool marks of, uh, of some of the other hard tools, the metal tools in particular, um, leave a lot of real sharp edges on the clay. And, you know, I could try to work those all off while the clay is, um, when the clay gets drier. Uh, but at this point, I, instead of trying to like remove them, I can just kind of push some of those little flecks and bits and um, sort of inconsistencies. If I can just kind of blend them into the clay itself, they really just sort of disappear almost a little bit like, um, say if you're accustomed to doing woodwork at all. It's a little bit like sanding away uh, imperfections. Uh, but uh, the clay at this point is so wet and workable still that uh, I can just sort of push them back into, uh, into the mold and uh, you'll never know they were there. Uh, a great way to do this as well, using nothing other than your hands, considering this is a hand building project, would be to use your thumb. So if you need to sort of remove a bit of texture, put a little bit of moisture, put a little bit of water on your thumb, and then use your thumb to just sort of polish away those areas. Uh, if, you're, if you're not removing texture, you're just trying to sort of put a final polish or a final surfacing on the outside so that it's not quite so bumpy and, and weird. Uh, just kind of work over it with your thumb and blend away those areas. I, uh, I love to kind of run a thumb over just about every kind of rough edge. If this is a bowl that I'm going to hold in my hands, or say I was forming a mug or something else that um, you know is designed to be uh, eaten out of or eaten with, uh, it shouldn't have any sharp edges on it, right? Think about you know picking up uh, your favorite mug and uh, finding it has a real rough or sharp edge or a fork that maybe has a gnarl on it or something. I mean, that's a, it's just kind of an uncomfortable uh, object to use. Uh, so this is that step where I can go through and work off any sharp, jagged things. Remember that the clay is real supple and soft now, but when it gets fired, it turns to stone. And uh, so a small little edge now that feels kind of innocuous and soft could become razor sharp when this clay becomes a piece of stone, or I should say stoneware. Uh, so it, it is really worth working over the outside of your piece and cleaning it up, not so that it you know looks cleaner necessarily, but so that uh, all those edges are knocked down. Uh, the last thing you might do, um, I shouldn't say last thing, but another kind of approach to, uh, to working off textures and stuff might be to bring the sort of sponge over. The sponge has a little bit more abrasive quality uh, than a thumb and uh, tends to leave a lot more marks behind. It does this thing called raising the burr uh, for a clay. It will sort of pull away some of the smooth clay and reveal some of the grit or grog. We, we're using a pretty smooth clay for our assignments, but um, even it has sort of chunks of sand and grain in it that if you run the sponge over it enough times, uh, you'll notice that it raises those right to the surface. Uh, and a thumb pushes them right back down in. So I just have a little bit more work to do on this guy before I'm going to call him done. Uh, I'll probably wait, you know, maybe another 15, 20 minutes, wait until it gets really nice and dry just to pick out some final little boogers that are stuck inside places. Um, I don't want to get in there right now because I might deform the piece. Uh, I intend to use this as a, uh, as a functional piece, right? I'm going to eat out of it or drink out of it. And so uh, to make that, um, to make that uh, safer, I'm going to make sure that the inside is nice and smooth. That way I can get a nice good bond with my glaze later on. Guys, I'm super excited to see what you did with this project, either if you copied mine or you know if you went at it on your own uh, to kind of design your own piece. Uh, if you have any issues with it, you can reach out to me in class. We'll talk about how to problem solve them. But um, otherwise, have fun, guys. See you in the studio.